schedules get a little bit challenging, but we do have uh, a program coming up in June. We're going to take July off for that very reason, but in June, uh, on the 16th, we have Mary Lashinger. Uh, for those of you who don't know Mary, she is chairman of the board and CEO of Veritiv. But without further ado, uh, it's a distinct pleasure of mine, and I would like to introduce today's speaker, Executive Vice President of Cox uh, Enterprises, Alex Taylor. As EVP, Alex oversees the company's long-term investment and growth strategies, including the Cox Innovation Fund and True North Venture Partners. He is a fourth-generation member of the Cox family and serves on its board of directors. Previously, Alex served as Senior VP of Field Operations for Cox Communications. In that capacity, he oversaw operations of all Cox's cable systems, serving over six million customers around the country. Alex has served as a reporter and editor with various Cox Media properties. And prior to Cox Communications, he served as an executive VP of Cox Media Group, where he was responsible for its television, radio, newspaper, and digital properties in Atlanta that reached nearly four million adults each week. Alex is an avid outdoorsman and environmentalist. Alex chairs the American Rivers Board of Directors, is a board member of Food Well Alliance and the PATH Foundation. He authored a wonderful book, The Longest Cast, A Fly Fishing Journey of a Lifetime, and donated the book's royalties to the International Game Fishing Association for the Preservation of the Endangered Fishing Sanctuaries. It's a wonderful book. Alex graduated from Vanderbilt with a bachelor's degree in science with a focus on human and organizational development. Please join me in welcoming this morning's speaker and my good friend, Alex Taylor. His topic this morning is Cox, an American business story through the generations. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Zach, thank you. I don't know if any of you uh, know Zach off, uh, off campus, but um, nobody ever wants to follow Zach as a speaker, particularly at a wedding. Um, <laughs> it's a tough act to follow, but um, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I actually got to the chance to speak at the uh, Grady School of Journalism uh, graduation just last week, so I'm feeling lots of dog love right now. I got my dog tie on. My wife is a dog. Um, in the best sense, she's uh, a, gra <laughs> a, gra a gra that sounded wrong, but it's um, a graduate of the uh, of the journalism school, and uh, and as such, most of my friends are bulldogs too. So I won't get into all the uh, all the tech jokes because um, probably don't need to with all the all the love going on. So um, I was thinking about what would be of interest to uh, to this audience, talking about Cox Enterprises and what we do, and um, it's not a public company that. Um, any of anybody here own stock in? Um, it's a it's a private family business, and um, and that's really what makes our company special. So I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the family nature, the family history, what got us here, and uh, sort of how we think about the uh, the future looking forward. So um, the the business is a uh, 117 years old. It was founded in 1898 by my great grandfather, uh, who's in the large picture here. He's also in some of the smaller pictures, uh, but he was a uh, he was a young guy born on a farm in d outside of Dayton, Ohio, in Jacksonburg, Ohio, a farm we still own. I can go into the room he was born in a um, long time ago. His great-grandfather built the house, um, you know, long, old roots in, in, uh, in Ohio, uh, Midwestern values, and, um, and a single business that he purchased uh, for $28,000. And over the years, it grew and blossomed and diversified, and, um, and it's maintained... Um, we've maintained 100% family ownership since the beginning. And for those of you who don't know a lot about family businesses, I'll give you a couple of facts. One is uh, family businesses, private family businesses, are the majority of businesses in America. They kind of make up all the mom and pop stores, gas stations, car dealerships, um, lots of banks, lots of um, all kinds of things. And to get a business from the first generation to the second, um, about 50% of businesses make it successfully through um, taxes and squabbling and all kinds of stuff to the second generation. To get from the second generation to the third generation, about 20% of businesses do that. And about 3% of them make it to the fourth generation. So it's very, very rare. And it takes, um, it takes certain attributes. Um, it's not just a favorable business environment. It's a family that all believes in the same thing. Um, and it's a family that's kind of held together by values. So a long time ago, um, when he passed away, he actually uh, he left behind a will. And in his will, he talked about how the good fortunes of uh, this family are entirely a result of the uh, hard work of its employees. And he said, um, 
I always try to make sure I remember the words correctly, but he said, I ask my, uh, my children and my trustees to always recognize that debt. And uh, so as a great grandchild and a trustee, um, I think about that a lot, and we always do. We think about um, how to make sure that it's a great place for our employees to work, uh, that we take care of people, we take care of our community, and that it's about a lot more than just money. It's not a story about money. It's a story about um, values and, and uh, continuing on for the next generation uh, sort of thing. Uh, the returns have been good. So uh, starting in 1898, if you took that $26,000, uh, you would have seen to today a 12% uh, compounded annual growth rate. So um, going through this next year, we'll be surpassing $20 billion in revenue. Uh, we don't just do newspapers anymore. We love our newspapers. In fact, they take up a disproportionate amount of time in our board meetings. The articles, <laughs> and um, when you live in the town that your newspaper, your biggest newspaper is in, it takes up a lot of conversation. And so Kevin is probably one of the busiest guys uh, in Atlanta with uh, not only phone calls from all of you, but from the chairman of the company and from me and from all of us at Cox. Um, but it's been a great business and it's continued on uh, for a very long time. And so today, the pieces of the business um, that make up Cox Enterprises, uh, as of last year's you know, final revenue numbers, uh, Cox Communications on the left is our cable business. Uh, we actually used to, people always ask, why don't you have cable in Atlanta? We are not allowed to have cable in Atlanta because we have too many other media properties. And a long time ago, we did have a franchise here and uh, we, had to, we had to get rid of it in favor of our existing uh, media properties. But we have uh, cable companies in, if you live in New Orleans, or uh, Omaha, or Rhode Island, uh, or San Diego, Las Vegas, Phoenix, places like that, you are most likely a Cox cable customer. And uh, it's a wonderful experience. If you uh, moved to any of those places, I highly recommend being a Cox cable customer. Um, Cox Automotive, um, long time ago, uh, 1963, we bought into a uh, auto auction uh, called Mannheim Auto Auctions. Is anybody here in the auto business? Um, so you might, you might know Mannheim, but uh, for those of you, if you're not a dealer, you might not know what Mannheim is. Mannheim is, an, is literally an auto auction. So if you've ever been to a cattle auction and they move cattle through the auction and they, they have a guy with a microphone talking real fast and you know, they take bids and they sell, auto dealers do that too. So when you have a, uh, an auto dealership, you have a huge lot with cars on it. Some of those cars come to you uh, when, when you get a trade in and then you sell a new car to somebody. Um, a lot of those cars, you know, you sell through that, that car that you took in through a trade and you sell it to an auction. The auction gives you money for it. Um, we create the market for that. And that was a business a long time ago because our biggest advertisers in almost all properties have always been auto dealers, auto ads and TV, radio, newspapers. And somehow or another that got us into the auction. Uh, because of that, uh, we've grown other auto businesses. Um, you may have heard of autotrader.com. So uh, autotrader.com is one of the uh, digital businesses that killed uh, the classified ads of the newspapers. They're not, didn't kill them, but, but hurt them very bad. There are three pillars of classified ads. There's auto, ad, auto ads, uh, real estate ads, and then miscellaneous uh, jobs ads and, and things like that. Um, so autotrader.com, when I was selling ads for the AJC, was like my worst enemy. Um, and then one day I realized that it actually, uh, we own this company, we started it. it uh, <laughs> I was like, well, that's great news. We, uh, it actually started out of the AJC. Some smart people many years ago started a business called AutoConnect, and, um, and that grew into a another publication, Trader Publications. You all might have remembered those stacks of magazines you saw in, in gas stations and stuff. Um, that turned into autotrader.com, which is now the largest um, digital automotive classified site. So autotrader.com, Mannheim, uh, Kelly Blue Book, um, lots of other digital businesses um, make up Cox Automotive. And this is actually the fastest growing portion of the business. So in five years, um, we believe that Cox Automotive will probably double and may be the same or <coughs> perhaps even larger than Cox Communications, uh, which is really, really exciting. There's a, it's a hotbed of software innovation, the inefficiencies of buying a car. Everybody here has bought a car and there's probably some portion of it, like sitting down at the desk with the guy who's negotiating the price and you're wondering if you're being taken advantage of and you're wondering how is this all happening and why does he keep getting up and going into the back room and <laughs> all that. That whole process is one that we're trying to fix end to end. Um, it's a very exciting business. And then of course Cox Media Group. Um, it's shown as the smallest part of the business and sometimes the folks that work at Cox Media Group don't like that. But I always remind people that if the only thing we ever did was our media businesses, Cox Media Group is larger than it has ever been. This is its largest year. 
It's the smallest portion of the business, which only speaks to its ability to have funded the diversification of the rest of the entire enterprise. Um, every dime that went into uh, Cox Cable and Cox Automotive came out of primarily the newspapers. So if, you, if people say, are the newspapers dead? When are, what's happening with newspapers? Newspapers gave life to everything we do. Everything, 100%. Um, and that's, pretty, that's a pretty extraordinary story if you think about it. Um, and something we're very proud of. So if you, um, if you go around the business, you know, I always say it's, it's not about the money, it's sort of about what got us here. You'll, you'll hear about our values, and our values are um, articulated most recently in a, in, a, in a couple of simple statements. Act now, be bold, and stay true. Um, and you, s you sort of see that whether you're in, uh, we saw it in Shanghai recently, and you see it here in Atlanta, and you see it in all the offices in between. But act now comes from my great-grandfather. Um, so this is a picture of him in 1939 when he had bought the Atlanta Journal. <coughs> and uh, the Atlanta Journal was bigger than all of his newspapers combined at that time. It was a very big newspaper. It was a very big, important paper. And back then, if you owned a big city newspaper, you know, presidents came to visit you. Um, it, was, uh, it was considered ex probably the most influential um, job you could have. So he was a very important guy. And somebody said, why did you, you're, he was 69 at the time. At 69, most people are thinking about retirement. You didn't live as long as you did back then. I mean, you, at 69, you're beginning to, you know, head back to the farm and, and enjoy life. And he said, um, he said, running waters never grow stagnant. Um, and it was a comment about how you can never stop. If you, as soon as you stop, things begin to wither and you always have to keep going. You always have to make your big bets. It doesn't matter how old you are um, or how tired you are, you got to keep going. You got to keep going. And, um, and so that's, that's one of our uh, values is always take big um, bets and don't ever slow down and don't ever assume that you've arrived because in five years you'll be irrelevant once again. You have to keep reinventing yourself. And uh, we try to do that through all of our businesses. So I told you about uh, the classified automotive ads. Classified automotive ads at the paper basically evolved into all these digital um, automotive businesses that we have around the world from auto auctions to autotrader.com um, and, uh, and elsewhere. Um, the other one is, is being bold. So this is one of my favorite stories. Um, this is a building. This is, there's lots of buildings, lots of Cox buildings around the world. Um, uh, I think there's something like 1,700 of them or something where we have employees doing business. Just an extraordinary amount of places. But this is the first place. Um, it's still there. And for those folks in here from Dayton, um, they know this building well. It's a very beautiful, ornate building. And it has a story behind it. So he started his business at the age of 28. Um, he built this building in 1910. So he's 40 years old. I mean, if you're 40 years old today and build a building like that, you're somebody. I mean, you're somebody with an attitude. You're somebody who's making a statement. Um, and so when he first bought his newspaper, the job of newspapers back then were to, was to, and it still is, to speak for those who don't have a voice, to provide uh, information for people, for, for the people that aren't powerful. The powerful have plenty of things going for them. But newspapers are, are there to shine light on the things that basically the, the powerful people are doing, and uh, particularly in, in public office. And um, that didn't go well with some of the powerful people in Dayton. Back then, if you were Dayton and Detroit, and that whole part of the middle part of the country was like Silicon Valley. Uh, the most powerful people in the country lived there. Uh, Charles Kettering, Henry Ford, um, Henry Pat uh, um, uh, John Patterson, who was probably the richest guy, one of the richest guys in America, lived in Dayton. And he didn't like my great-grandfather. They actually respected each other, but he didn't like some of these articles that were getting written about him. And, um, and my, my great-grandfather said in his book, the, the, the lawsuits fell like snowflakes. Um, <laughs> so they just, they just started falling. And he needed to take, he couldn't afford lawsuits. This was his first experience with, um, with fighting legal battles, not just writing articles. And uh, it was very, very expensive. And he actually had to go to the bank and take loans out. He didn't like debt. He still don't like debt, but he took loans out to pay his payroll so his employees could continue doing their job. And at some point, the banks thought to themselves, so we, our biggest customers are these big, powerful, rich guys, and we are funding the guy that they hate the most to fight them. And pretty soon, or sooner or later, the Patterson and the rest of them figured that out too, and they said, stop giving them money. And um, so they did, and they said, um, they said, uh, Jimmy, they're going to be here longer than you are, and we can't continue to do this. And, um, and I, always, I always think what was going on in his mind that night 
I mean, he must have thought, I got to go home and tell my wife it's over. I, I don't, uh, I'm out of money. Um, and somehow or another, um, three days later, Patterson, the, who was in Scotland you know, doing, doing something, he sent back a telegram to immediately drop all lawsuits against uh, Jimmy Cox. And I'm like, what? What did they get to him? <laughs> they, 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 they had the nuclear option and they used it. Um, but somehow or another, the man dropped all the, all the lawsuits and you know, a, a window was reopened. And he recovered financially and um, he came back and he built this building and he built it across the street from the bank. And you might, <laughs> notice, you might notice that it looks a lot like a bank. It's just, it's just a few feet taller and a little bit wider. Um, and that was sort of his statement about, we'll see who's gonna be here for the long run. The bank is long gone. Um, uh, NCR is no longer in Dayton. Uh, that's the that was the business Patterson owned. It's actually here in Atlanta now, and um, just like Cox, but this building still stands, and it's a it's a testament to being bold and to putting your your flag in the ground and your stake in the sand, and saying we're going to be here for a while. Um, and we're not about buildings and things. We are more about values and culture. But um, we do this today. So um, you know, if if we w if we were a, a a family or a business that was interested in exiting or liquidating or getting out of the business. Um, we would do that, but you know we've built a corporate campus just north of uh, the perimeter here in Dunwoody. Um, it's beautiful. If anybody hadn't been there, I'm happy to take you on a tour. Come on out. Um, but it's kind of our stake in the sand, and I think the employees that, that work there would tell you that it's got uh, one of the best restaurants, uh, good organic food, and, and one of the best workout facilities. So um, the gym, my uncle Jim is, you know, for those of you who don't know him, a fitness nut. He's really into health, and he wants employees to be too. So we try to make it a great place to work out, a great place to stay and dine and, and uh, collaborate and, and work together and uh, it's kind of like our stake in the sand. And the final thing and probably the most important one is stay true. So these values that came, you know, that came out of the will, that came out of this man who had these words that people have trouble forgetting um, have lived with us for a long time and staying true um, has kind of taken its form in different ways throughout the years. So uh, back in 1913, the largest natural disaster to ever hit the United States hit in, of course, Dayton, Ohio. Um, this is a picture outside of that same building, that tall building on the right. Um, in this picture, I believe, was empty, but there was 30 feet of water going up to the second story of the building. The entire press uh, went underwater. There's five rivers that con converge just north of Dayton, and they all flooded the banks. And uh, thousands of people were killed, uh, horses uh, dead everywhere. It was, a, it was a total catastrophic disaster. My um, my great-grandfather, who was the publisher of the paper, and this was his flagship, literally completely destroyed. Imagine our entire corporate campus being completely destroyed. Um, that's what happened. He was also, at the time, the governor of Ohio. So he was back in uh, Columbus trying to deal with this national disaster. The president's calling. Other governors are trying to chip in. There's, they don't know how many people have died. Uh, they're, they're rallying uh, rescue um, uh, resources. And, but the but he didn't have to worry about his business because even though it was completely destroyed, the people weren't completely destroyed. So they, um, uh, they did all kinds of extraordinary things. One is they, uh, they brought in outside presses. One of the presses came from uh, Columbus, Ohio on a horse-drawn carriage and at the water's edge, they would pump out hand crank newspapers and deliver them uh, to people because back then the only way you get information, you don't pull out your cell phone and say what's happening out there in the world, uh, you get a newspaper and they continue delivering newspapers. Um, they also, my, uh, my great-grandfather um, Patterson, who you've, you've heard about earlier in this story, was, at, was on house arrest um, for other reasons. He, he had, he had a, a habit of getting in a lot of trouble. And one of, the, one of the things he didn't like was competition. So when other cash register companies popped up, um, he would just vandalize their businesses, just break the windows and steal their stuff and things like that. So they had him on house arrest. And, um, but, my, but he was a very capable guy. He was very, very famous. They said that in the late 20s, one third of all Harvard MBA graduates went to work for John Patterson. I mean, he was very, a very famous, powerful guy. Um, and my, my great grandfather said, although you're on house arrest, I need you to leave your house and I need you to um, help with this, with, this, um, with this crisis. In fact, he gave a martial law, uh, instituted martial law in Dayton and said, you're in charge of saving people. So he, um, they collected driftwood and all kinds of resources at the NCR headquarters, which was a big place back then, and they built boats, and they went from rooftop to rooftop and saved people. Um, but it's a story about how people can overcome anything. When we have an economic downturn these days, you know, you get all these people talk about like it's the end of the world. Um, 
you know, our Kager our dropped 200 basis points, you know, <laughs> you know, during the Great Depression or the Great Recession. And I, I said to my grandmother, uh, have you ever seen it this bad? And she looked at, she's, she's still with us, she's 96 years old. She said, I've seen it much worse. And she's talking about back in these days when things weren't quite so easy, uh, but things can get bad. And, th and this stories like this, for me, put things in perspective. A hundred years later, um, well, so this is a, another example of some of the things we do in the community. So that's the employees, you know, saving the business. This is uh, employees today. We try to um, encourage them to get out into the community and, uh, and be involved. Um, but I wanted to uh, point out that a hundred years later, after that flood, another Cox market was flooded in Katrina. Um, and it's kind of a, a, an extraordinary story because some of the same things happened. The entire market went underwater. A hundred percent of our cable business, which was, you know, a thousand times larger than that newspaper ever was, went underwater and was destroyed. And um, we had 1,200 Cox employees that were affected there. Hundreds of them lost absolutely everything. And my Uncle Jim uh, sent out a note and said, you know, our fellow employees are in trouble. Um, can people, if you want to donate, we've set up a website and, and we can help. Uh, some of our employees went there and they literally had canoes and they went out. There was a couple of sort of rescues from people that couldn't get out of the water. Um, and there was also something set up called the Cox Employee Disaster Relief Fund and uh, millions of dollars were raised by employees for employees. And, um, and then when the, and, and they, they helped people rebuild, recover. Um, insurance wasn't always uh, that easy to give people the funding they needed to buy their things back, get a car, get their life back on, on their feet. And so um, the Employee Disaster Relief Fund was there for extraordinary things like acts of God. Um, after this crisis was over, we find that with 50, 60,000 employees, things happen every day. Every single day I hear a story about a drunk driving accident, a brain tumor, something that's going on in people's lives, extraordinary acts of God that make, uh, that reminds you that life can be difficult. And uh, the, em the Employee Disaster Relief Fund is there to give money to employees uh, above and beyond what things that insurance will cover. And uh, it's an extraordinary um, example of, of the culture because our employees really care about uh, really care about each other. And so those are the values. And you say, well, so what? What is that? You know, all these stories about the past, what does that mean for the future? And that's sort of my job is to think about the future because all these great family members we have are eclipsed by all these future family members we have. So this is, I'm a member, member of generation four and that used to be kind of a novelty. The new thing is generation five, apparently. There's like, they're popping up everywhere. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is my daughter, Morgan, and this is my son, Winston. Um, they're three and one now. Uh, my cousin, this, uh, Jim's daughter, uh, Barbara, over there with her kids, and, uh, and a picture of um, uh, several of us over there on the right. So that's Jim and uh, me and my grandmother, um, Ann Chambers, who's going on 97 this year. Um, uh, for those of you who know her, she's, she's actually got a compost pile in her backyard now, and she makes soil, and she every day goes out and gets on her uh, knees and, and digs all holes and and plants, um, plants flowers, because that's what she likes to do. She does it still to this day. Um, she also has a little putting green set up in her living room. She's putting balls, and she, <laughs> when she misses, she goes, God damn it! <laughs> so, and she, uh, she's, got a, she's got a wonderful personality, and she just, she just keeps going and going and going, and she's really extraordinary. And, and then on the far right there is my cousin and uh, sort of um, comrade in arms, Jamie Kennedy, who's uh, Jim's son. Um, he's also on the board with us, and um, he's getting his, uh, PhD in clinical psychology. Um, this is a reminder, he also has a uh, MBA from Stanford. So this is a, a guy who's far smarter than I am, but uh, we work together very, very well. Um, but we have, a, we have a big family and we're thinking about the future and kind of where we're going. Um, so today, uh, if you think about 12%, if the, c if the company continued to grow for 12% from now until say another 20 years, it would be in the hundreds of billions of dollars, something like $160 billion in revenue. That's how compounding uh, works. It's a, uh, it's almost too much to even think about. So I said, if we can continue like we always have to exceed the S and P, and grow at a steady uh, six and a half percent growth rate for the next 20 years, we started thinking about this in 2014 when I took my current job. In 2034, where would we be? And in 2034, we call it future focus. 2034, uh, we'd be at about 60 billion dollars, and not all of that growth can come from our existing businesses. Our existing businesses will fund some of it, inflation will fund some of it, um, but we have to start to bring into focus the other things that we're also interested in. Um, so if you look out 20 years, I always think, I can't control the ultimate vision. I can't say this is exactly how it's gonna be because the, the one thing you know about a strategy or a vision is that it's inaccurate. 
Um, but it's, it's, uh, it's like a mosaic. You kind of, there's certain things that if we get this right, um, we can be happy. Um, so in 20 years, I would see us having done a good job of investing in our media businesses, our automotive businesses, and our telecommunication businesses, but then also investing in other things we care about. Um, one of them is sustainability. Um, so we've got, you know, by any stretch of the imagination, a pretty substantial uh, business in alternative energies. Um, I'll tell you about some of them, um, but, uh, you know, so we have solar fields uh, in various places around the country. Down in South Georgia, we have a place where we're uh, drilling into not, um, not shale for oil, but we're actually drilling into a, land, uh, a landfill, and because landfills ex um, exude um, methane, and, and we compress that methane and sell it. And uh, so it's creative technologies to figure out ways to um, make energy in clean and renewable ways. Uh, we have a company called Harvest Power. This is, a, this is a one that I'm, I'm particularly excited about. Harvest Power uh, takes advantage of the fact that um, uh, the country throws away hundreds of millions of tons of food every year. It's one of our biggest, it's actually our largest emitter of greenhouse gases is methane. All that food that you throw away, hot dogs and cookouts and all that stuff, goes into a, a landfill and turns into methane. And methane is by far the biggest emitter of uh, greenhouse gases in the world. And uh, what Harvest does is it, it, it figures out ways for commercial entities to divert their food waste to what they call anaerobic digesters. It's like a gigantic, not to gross you out, but it's like a gigantic industrial stomach. And you put it in a, it looks like a corn silo. And it, it bakes, it cooks this food off into electricity. And the electricity goes back into the grid. And at the end of the day, what's left at the bottom of that silo is essentially mulch. <laughs> and they bag it and they sell it. In fact, if you go to Lowe's, uh, today. Uh, we love Home Depot here in Atlanta. Home Depot has not bought this yet, but at Lowe's you can get it. I, I still support Home Depot, but <laughs> if you go to Lowe's, um, you'll find that there are three types of mulch. There's uh, Scotty's, um, one other kind, and then there's Lowe's Harvest Garden Pro. That is Cox Mulch, and I highly recommend it it's <laughs> if you, uh, you want to go do some gardening. Um, international. Uh, the nature of our businesses are, um, are local. Um, you know, newspaper franchises, even a TV station, a cable franchise, it's defined as a single, as a certain footprint, a DMA. Um, and we've always operated our businesses within those footprints. And, um, but with our automotive businesses and with uh, media and everything becoming m more and more uh, digital, digital really has no footprint. And so a lot of our focus now is on uh, international. Um, we put a, a small investment a rel relatively small investment into a company called Bit Auto, which is the sort of the autotrader.com of, of China. We put $40 million into it. Within 18 months, that $40 million had turned into a $900 million valuation. Just that one, um, just that one investment. Uh, within another three months, it had turned back into a $300 million investment, <laughs> uh, which tells you about the volatility of international investing. It can go really, really great, or it can go really, really bad, um, but there's a huge amount of opportunity out there. If you just think about what's happening in China, um, and in India, and in Brazil, and South Africa, and other places. Um, the world is e emerging. Um, America is a very small place. Our economy is very big and very mighty, but the rest of the world is just about to happen. Um, and there's huge opportunities out there. And then there's greenfield opportunities, so things that we've never been involved in, uh, but we take an interest in. Things like uh, education and healthcare. We've invested in several businesses. Um, one of them is called Udacity, uh, the guy that founded uh, Google X Labs. So he brought you the glass, the Google Glass that you wink with, and he brought you autonomous vehicles. Uh, he actually left Google X and founded a company called Udacity, which is essentially online education. He believes that it doesn't matter if you're, you could be in Africa or China or, or the North Pole, you should be able to have access to a first class education. He's, he's developing that like a lot of other people, and we've invested. And then there's new businesses, um, businesses that we incubate and start internally. I'll tell you quickly about one of those. So, because we just, this one just won the uh, Sports Business Journal Award last night. Uh, it's called Experience. I don't know if anyone has been to a live event recently, but there are 600 million tickets sold to live events every year in the United States. Uh, the Braves, Hawks, Falcons, uh, the Zoo, Fernbank, um, what have you. And when you go into that event or when you go to that place, that ticket gives you access. Um, if you were a VIP, you would have access to other um, opportunities. Uh, the problem is those, those venues can't offer those opportunities to everybody. It's a limited amount of people they can offer them to. So if you wanted your son on his birthday to get up on the Jumbotron um, or have the cheerleaders come and sing happy birthday or 
that, that ball that Villanova sunk in the last second of the, of the buzzer, at that moment, that ball is worth $10,000. In five minutes, it'll be worth maybe $1,000. And in 10 minutes, nobody will even know where it is. Nobody will care. But that venue would love to sell that ball at that very moment. And you can push that into a mobile device uh, through an auction. And people can buy those events. You want to go into the, the dugout? They can't do that for everybody. They can do it for one person. So you can push events. You can push VIP experiences. And Experience is a technology platform. Uh, it's got about 80 employees right up here on Peachtree. It's a, it's a dot-com startup. That started uh, started right here out of Atlanta. Uh, we're very proud of it, and it just won the Sports Business Journal Technology of the Year Award uh, for the second time. Um, <laughs> but these are, you know, a lot of these stories you would read about in Wired or TechCrunch or something if they were part of a public company. Uh, but you don't hear about them because we're private, and uh, we keep them private. Um, Jim doesn't like beating his chest too much. He he often says, um, not to make too much noise because then the snipers know where to shoot. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and so we don't we don't talk about all the successes we have, but. Um, there are a good many of them. Um, and so when we talk about that march to 60 billion, we try to simplify things down to a couple of um, key elements we have to get right. One is core transformation. Uh, our core businesses are amazing. They've gotten us here, but they won't get us into the future. They have to transform and they have to iterate. And they have to get better and better. Um, adjacencies. So these are things that kind of expand the core. They're right next to it, but they're not quite what we do. Um, and then there's diversification. So one thing we're doing to transform the core, um, I told you about the uh, automotive business and these auctions. Uh, one of the ways that they, they eventually said, well, one of the problems our customers have is they don't have enough money to buy these cars. So let's give them money. We'll lend it to them. And they started uh, Mannheim Automotive Financial Services back in 1993. And then a competitor to them called DSC was founded in Carmel, Indiana um, in 2004, about 10 years later. They were competitors. Um, so we, we purchased that business and merged the two of them. Um, and that at that time, that business uh, was had about $500 million into it. And uh, it was a good mid-sized lending business. Today, that business has $4.8 billion of outstanding loans to people, to, to dealers that need to buy cars to put on their lot. Um, it's a business that's probably worth, um, you know, three, three plus billion dollars conservatively. Um, but they have transformed that business. It's a phenomenal investment. Really smart, hardworking people. They're all up in Carmel, Indiana, and they are, they are on fire. They're doing a great, great job. And it's one of the you know, fast, high growth uh, parts of our business right now. Adjacencies. So if you think about the connections that a cable company makes, it connects you to video. You might get your, um, your, your, your phone calls done. You can call grandma with uh, your, your, uh, your phone connection. Your internet connection connects you to everything. Another important connection out there is the ability for a patient to be connected with their doctor. Um, you know, we believe you shouldn't have to leave home when you're sick. 80% of healthcare costs in, in America are for chronic care monitoring. Uh, you might know someone that has diabetes or cancer or something that requires them to leave the home and go to a hospital over and over and over and over again for the rest of their lives. Um, that is inefficient. It, it doesn't have a lot of dignity. You don't want to get your elderly relative out of the house into a car, go see the doctor, get their blood tested. You can do that kind of stuff from home now. Uh, more and more, you should be able to do that from home. And Tropalo is a company that we've purchased that um, it, it finds out what the best types of electronics are that when you leave the hospital with a diagnosis for a chronic care condition, they will send you home with devices that will allow you to have your blood diagnosed, have your heart pressure checked, get your pulse checked, all the basics that a doctor could use remotely, and you can do the equivalent of Skyping with them. They can get your data. It can be kept on a dashboard. We have Fitbits. We have all kinds of devices that are monitoring what's going on in our bodies now. Um, and that should be able to connect you with a doctor so you don't have to leave home when you're sick. Um, and then in diversification, there's a company right here in Atlanta called Nexus Fuels um, that we invested in. So Nexus takes waste plastic. A lot of people don't think about this, but when I was a kid, when you drank water, you went to a, a water fountain. Today, you buy a plastic bottle. And these plastic bottles, this plastic bottle, took about three quarters of a cup of oil to manufacture. All those bottles you throw away, every time you'd want to drink a, a glass of water or a bottle of water, you just consumed a, a, a about a cup of raw crude oil. Um, and we don't think about that, but we should because the population is growing and we're doing more of this. Um, Nexus Fuels takes those plastics, and there's a lot of it. There's uh, garbage, ba garbage bags, uh, shopping bags, PVC pipes, water bottles, and turns it back into oil. Uh, where, where it came from. And it's a pretty extraordinary business. And then you just sell the oil like anything else, but you can kind of reuse things. 
Um, so those are three examples of the three things that we need to get right. Um, and who knows what it's going to be? You know, I always say that Columbus said, we're going to Asia the other way. We're not going to walk across the Middle East. We're going to go across the ocean. And he never got there. He believed for a long time when he got to San Salvador that he was actually in Japan. And he insisted upon it. And he actually went back and said, I think I found some outer islands of Japan. Um, he never got to where he was trying to get. Uh, but it was the vision that got the world to think differently and to go in another direction. And that's kind of like our vision. I know that what we imagine is going to happen. So many things are going to happen in the meantime. Um, and we're not going to do exactly what we think we're going to do. But it's the vision that has us going in the right direction, the things we're passionate about, the things we're excited about. And that's kind of what's motivated us from the beginning is a vision of a better world. Um, Jim always says that the ultimate goal of the company is to leave it in better condition for the next generation. And so the bottom line goal that I have is to make sure that Winston and all of his cousins and Morgan, Greer always says, why do you always mention Winston? <laughs> um, Winston and Morgan and all their cousins have, um, have, a, have something that they can be proud of the same way that I can. And people that came before me can. Um, and I talk, to, I talk to our employees about this a lot all over the world and, and, um, and tell them to remember what the ultimate goal is. It's to make, try to make the world a better place and leave it in better condition than he found it. And I can't bring Jim with me all the time because uh, he speaks so eloquently. Uh, but we do, um, I do bring a video with me that I think is, um, is logged in here. And I'll, I'll play that video for you so you can hear from Jim. But we're here today to talk about our company and where we're going in the future. And the future is going to be determined by all of you. The people of Cox Enterprises make this company great. The best part about my job at Cox is getting to be part of a team that's going to build the next generation of services and products for our customers. My role is building a new product and services for Cox. This business is kind of the next evolution. We made it through the worst recession that anybody my age has ever seen. And we still managed to grow and invest. During that time, from 2008 until today, we've invested more than $10 billion in growth for our company. We've done such incredible deals as Kelly Blue Book, V Auto, and now the biggest acquisition of them all, Dealer Track. Those were wonderful additions to our automotive group. And not just because those were great companies, because they brought great people with them. My role within the company is to work on these amazing brands that we have within the Cox Automotive portfolio. But we're reinventing them, we're evolving them, we're changing them. This aligns so perfectly with Cox Enterprises and what Cox has done for decades. After 116 years, it's an incredible history. My heart is still very much with newspapers. I read the Atlanta Journal-Constitution every single day, and I can tell you, in my life, that newspaper has never been better. And it's making a difference that people are counting on. And I look for all of our businesses to do that. But what is really exciting is the future. I'm delighted that Alex Taylor and my son Jamie are both members of our board now, so the fourth generation is active in our company. It's so exciting to think how this company has evolved over many, many years. We're larger than we've ever been. We're stronger than we've ever been. But the question is, what's next? And that's the legacy of Cox. That's the energy and the enthusiasm that this company has. So as we look and try and determine where Cox is going to be in 10 or 20 years, we look to people like you to help us find ways to grow, to diversify, to continue the principles of Cox, that it's not just about making money, it's about doing good. It's about being a contributor to society. It's about giving opportunities to our employees to have a good career, to have a good life, and to do something that's meaningful. I wish I could be with you today. I'm sorry I'm not, but I look forward to sharing all the fun and excitement as this company grows into the future. appreciation at all for the video or any of the imagery there's four ladies that are sitting right here right now Natalie Sanji Elizabeth and Christine who do all of this stuff and uh, when you talk about the great people of Cox um, if everybody would just look at them for a moment and let the <laughs> let the let the vibe uh, sink in <laughs> and 
thank you all for what you do. Um, and that's our story. I'd love to, uh, I'm available for any questions or Perfect. snacks. Should I? If, uh, uh, everyone, if you'd wait, we're going to have a couple microphones circulating in the room. This is going to be podcast and memorialized forever. Great. So <laughs> make sure that you ask really insightful questions, and there'll be a couple microphones on their way to you. And also, I'll just, I'll just say there's no, uh, there's nothing awkward about asking about the family. We're, uh, you know, all families are weird, so I expect all answers to be weird. And, and uh, feel free to uh, to ask candid questions about any topic, business or otherwise you like. Um, love to entertain them. Yes, sir. Hey, Jim. Alex, automotive is a big part of your business, and then you've also got a lot of vehicles. Chevy's got a lot of vehicles on the road every day. Are you all looking into driverless vehicles? Is that an area of investment? Um, it's a it's it's a it's something that is affecting our business a lot. So uh, we don't manufacture cars, so we're not going to be manufacturing driverless vehicles. But um, a driverless vehicle uh, is essentially a connected car. Um, it's connected to the internet and GPS, and uh, it, it could operate without a, a person on board. All Everything that allows that to happen, safety, uh, directional guidance, uh, the programming for what it's going to do is all part of the software that governs the automotive ecosystem. So after the car is born, i.e. comes out of the factory, and before it goes into the grave, i.e. salvaged, everything that happens in between is, uh, is what we do. We're the, we're the largest automotive services company in the world. Uh, so everything that happens after manufacturing and before salvage is what we do. So if um, in its abstract, if driverless cars were uh, to become the norm, um, you would go from somewhere in the neighborhood of um, 300, 400 million cars in the country to um, about two and a half million uh, very quickly. Uh, if, if, if you're assuming everybody takes Uber, if my car drops me off at work in the morning and then I get out of it and it goes home and takes my wife out to do all of her errands and then she lends it to her friends and, uh, and you no longer, Americans I always say like to ride their own horse. You own your own car, you take it with you everywhere you go. Um, I think that'll be true for a long, long time. Um, but if it, if it weren't, uh, there would be a lot of turnover, a lot of moving cars, a lot of new software um, and I think we would be in a good position to take advantage of that. Um, that would be the, that would be the hope. Being the leader in an industry that's going through a lot of change is usually, if you're progressive, a good thing. If you're if you're standing still, it's not a good thing. But uh, we would hopefully be thinking about how that all the opportunities that presents rather than the than the uh, challenges. Yes, ma'am. Good morning. Hi. Uh, uh, my car. My really my question is related to driverless cars as well. Um, I heard a very provocative radio story about how it would transform essentially that we wouldn't be riding our own horses, that there would be fleets, mm -hmm. and that essentially parking garages would become a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if, if Cox was going to invest in that way in terms of, um, I think even the big auto companies are considering having their own fleets and essentially cars would be on the road and with within five minutes could be where you needed it. But you wouldn't own yeah. it anymore. Yeah, and I've seen models. Uh, if, if has anyone been to Shanghai recently? Anyone in this room? A couple. Um, they need. They have parking problems. Uh, <laughs> we were. I mean, everywhere we went, we would get into a car, pull out of the of the hotel, and then just stop for the longest period of time. And I, you know, you could walk and get there faster. They have so many cars. The the last number on your license plate dictates what day of the week you're allowed to use it because they have to get cars off the street, and they have nowhere to park them. So I've seen technology where a car goes into a, um, a parking garage, it gets picked up, turned sideways, and then slotted into a, a f like a folder for cars. And then when you come out, you push your number like you would on a, on a, um, on a vending machine, and it comes back out and is delivered to you. Uh, can't leave change in the cup holders anymore. There's all kinds of problems with that. But, um, but parking technology and coming up with more efficient ways to <laughs> park cars, and ideally if they're, if, they're, um, if they're driverless, you could have remote parking get dropped off and then it goes off to the parking um, uh, thing. So it's, uh, it's a huge opportunity. Um, big industries like that typically, um, newspapers are an exception to this. Things changed extremely fast. But usually big industries like that and people's habits change slowly. Um, and so I would, I would assume this will happen over a period of time and that we'll kind of constantly be iterating and figuring out ways to, uh, to evolve into that new reality. 
but it will be particularly overseas a bigger a bigger issue. Alex, yes. Um, yes. as you leader of strategic investments, as you think about the future, you guys are trying to expand in a lot of different areas. That requires a high degree of discipline and and certain guiding principles that you guys have to go through. Would you speak to kind of what your process there as much as you can? Um, okay, so we have a um, something that I call um, a, a values-adjusted return on capital. Um, so there are lots of great opportunities out there. Um, there's risk-adjusted opportunities for overseas things, and um, but then there's some things we won't do. So um, dirty businesses that don't make that make the world uh, nastier. Um, less desirable, uh, might make you a lot of money, but it's not something that we're gonna do. So we kind of weed those out, and then we think about areas that we're passionate about, particularly sustainability. We just believe that in the future, um, there's gonna be more and more money put into this, and there's gonna be ways to make energy that doesn't require um, so much destruction um, to the world. And, uh, and so we sort of think about where, what, are we, what are our value, what, what direction do our values point us in, and then we look for opportunities there. Um, we also, you know, what I talk a lot about is being comfortable with risk and sometimes failure. So um, there's been, I talk about all the great things. There's been plenty of things that haven't gone well. We, uh, we owned a company called Reicher Studios. Um, we tried to make movies. Sounded pretty cool. Get to go to the Academy Awards. Um, it's not a very cool business. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a tough business. And, um, and uh, some of the digital businesses that we've invested in, there was one, uh, one called Adify that we put a, a lot of money into and it just, Advertising went a different direction. And um, a lot of times people will say, whose idea was it? Um, why did we lose money? Whose failure was it? And, um, but then on the, other, on the flip side, there's a lot of people that say, well, what did we learn from it? You know, so um, people came out of that company with, uh, with different ideas. They realized what doesn't work, so what does work? And that's part of what we bought in that company. So turning failure into a lesson um, that can, I would actually say that Adify, which is no longer around, turned into some other phenomenal things that we learned great lessons from. But understanding that on the in the long run, if you're not failing, it's like fly fishing. If, you're, if your fly is not getting caught in the bushes, it's because you're not casting close enough to the bank where the fish are. Um, and you have to take risks. And you have to kind of push it a little hard. You know, if a kid's not falling down while they're learning to walk, they're never going to learn to walk. Um, so um, trying to get comfortable with risk and failure uh, in addition to success. You talked a little bit about India and China and kind of the, the brick nation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, how do you protect against, I guess, intellect intellectual property or uh, strategic investments in those countries when you hear about, you know, like Xiaomi and China debatably stole Apple's technology and, you know, growing on a phenomenal hockey stick? I mean, how do you, how do you protect against that when you have like potentially hostile governments and? People yeah. who don't respect intellectual property. Intellectual it's the property, it's the right? governments are people are very similar um, in most places, and uh, the governments, the, particularly the government of China, is is just brazen in their uh, in their in theft. Um, they steal technology. They they go after and try to seek things that they can steal. When you when you go to China, um, there wasn't a lot of people near that been there. You know, if you if you do your homework ahead of time, they tell you don't bring your cell phone because when it comes back, it will forever be databasing all of your credit card information and everything. They, they plant software on it when you get there. Um, when I was there, um, it was their sort of national day where they drive missiles up and down the street, like intercontinental ballistic missiles. And <laughs> I'm like, oh boy. And, uh, <laughs> and on that day, they were, exerted, they were showing some of their prowess and they drove their um, warships too, cl too close to our international waters um, off of Alaska. It was a big story and I'm sitting there in China like, oh my goodness, what's happening? So I pull it up on Google, get a CNN story. I click on it page not available. So I go back to Google to try to get another one. Google not available. They just, they don't want people hearing that story in China. So they just shut, w they have data that just shuts it down. So I could not get that story when I was in China, even though I was connected to the internet. Um, it is a very big brother um, dynamic and you have to be cognizant of the fact that when you're in a hotel room, you're probably, uh, you, you may very well be, be monitored. Um, that's a scary world. I mean, that's going way, way back to things, to lessons that in America we feel like we learned a long time ago uh, during the Cold War. But, um, but we still live in that kind of world, and you have to be careful with who your partners are. Uh, governments um, are probably abroad. Governments, governments are more dangerous than the actual people. So you have to, you have to know um, who your partners are. Um, you'd be amazed. Big public companies in China that we've you know, considered investments with, they don't have audited financial statements. Um, 
they give you a set of books that have no independent verification. Um, you know, that's sort of, you know, warning number one. Um, you go, then you, you know, you see you have to get audited financials and then we spend time with uh, our partners. We have a couple of great partners that we trust um, a lot, and, uh, but it is risky. And, um, and you never know what's gonna happen to your ideas um, because if you patent something in the United States, it should protect you abroad, but it doesn't necessarily. Um, and that's just, that's the nature of the world we live in. You gotta watch your back and, and know who you're, who you're doing business with. Yes, ma'am. So we just graduated 5,500 amazing students from the university last week. Yes. Um, so what does Cox look for, for our students that are, you know, our graduates that are saying, we'd like to work for you guys. What would be some of the ideal qualities you're looking for from our students? Um, I mean, things are so, first of all, we are really excited about what we call this the ne next generation. We love everybody who's running our businesses now, but we put a lot of thought into making sure it's a good company for the next gen. And we can, we consider next gen people, um, gen, gen X, millennials, everyone loves their millennials. You know, <laughs> most overstudied generation on earth. Um, but uh, uh, Gen X, millennials, and then now Gen Z, they're, they're starting to kind of come into the, into the workforce. And they're roughly defined as people in their 20s, 30s, and 40s. And, um, and they think about the world entirely differently. Uh, they consume things differently. Um, and they're going, to, um, they're going to change the way all of our businesses are done. So we want to make sure uh, that we are bringing them in and providing a place where they can move up in the world and, and, and stay with us and create a career. So um, last year, um, 33,000 of our employees were next gen, uh, 20s, 30s, and 40s, and uh, 8,000 of them, I, I did the research on this recently, 8,723 of them got a promotion uh, last year. And so I said, uh, we could probably do better, but that's a lot of young people moving up in this company, which uh, tells me that uh, we're doing a good job of thinking about the future. And the things we look for are, are varied, but in almost, in almost every situation, the thing that probably gets uh, Jim and I most excited is if, if you're willing to pound your fist on the table. Um, you know, there's a lot of committees in the world and there's a lot of people that sit around tables just nodding heads and kind of being part of the pack and making sure they don't get in any trouble. Uh, we love people that are willing to say, I, I want to do this. I, I want this very badly. You know, if they're asking for an investment, um, Jim will usually say no. Uh, you know, because if you're not willing to pound your fist on the table, you're probably not passionate enough about it. Um, the good news is young, young people are extremely passionate. So um, uh, we're hiring a bunch of UGA grads. Um, I've, I've met several of them uh, last week. Um, so just being passionate, being excited, and being willing to dive in and work hard. Um, Hard work kind of goes back to the Ohio roots. Uh, we value it. You don't have to be, the, there's lots of smart people out there. It helps to be smart. Please try to be smart. But, <laughs> um, but uh, if there could be people that are smarter than you. But if you work hard and show up early and, and log in your hours, uh, you're probably going to um, get more done than the average person. And, um, you know, nothing rocket science wise, but hard work, passion, uh, honesty, trust, integrity. Yeah, yes, sir. Eric Pace. Um, Hi. What is what is in the future of newspapers for you guys, and what has uh, what Jeff Beasley has done with the Post influenced him as a as a strategic thinker? Well, um, being in the industry, I've got I've had the experience to uh, talk to some of the folks that now work with Jeff Bezos at the Washington Post, and what is fascinating is, in my mind, his stock has gone up. Um, he is a, I mean, he's not living in D.C., but he's a hands-on publisher. I mean, he has the news people gathered around tables and he's, you know, giving orders, giving new ideas, try this, try that. And I think he's just fascinated with the power of news. So when you say newspapers, the paper piece is what I would say is uh, in question. How long uh, we actually print papers seven days a week and deliver them to thousands of homes, which is uh, a, a, a very inefficient process to get news to people. There's a lot better ways to do it. Um, our digital products, um, uh, AJC.com um, is one of the biggest digital brands in the Southeast. And over the last couple of years, um, they have thought of new ways to use that, that platform to distribute news in other ways. Um, one of our favorites is Dog Nation. Anybody? <laughs> um, <laughs> but we realized that there are affinity groups that just love certain topics like um, recruiting. Um, not just news about what happened in the game or what happened yesterday. It's what's happening next season. 
Um, who is this new coach? What is he up to? Who's he talking to? What kind of people is he going around recruiting? Is this person going to stay on the team or not? Uh, people are just rapidly uh, excited about that. And, um, and so we've launched Dog Nation, SEC Country, uh, Mundo Hispanico. I don't know if I can mention the others because they might, might not have come out of the, come out of the uh, darkness yet into the light. But uh, there's lots of things um, in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in the works. And um, uh, Amy Glennon, who uh, a lot of you might know, is, um, she actually is the publisher of the paper. And she's now in charge of these emerging verticals because um, they're growing faster than almost any Cox business. So it's amazing that out of, out of a place where you've had the most turmoil and the most disruption, you can actually have the greatest ideas. And that is, that is really one of, the, one of the great lessons of the entire um, uh, story of the company. Um, these new businesses, new news verticals that are being distributed digitally. I still get print papers to my office every day. I get uh, the Wall Street Journal and the AJC and I have a, a, a big wide desk and I lay the papers out and I like to turn the I like to see how they're laid out. I like to see how one story plays off another. Um, and I read it every day. And I still enjoy it. My mother gets five or six newspapers delivered to her house every day. She, she cuts them out, sends them to me in envelopes with notes on them. <laughs> and they're like in different envelopes, too. I'll get three from the same day, different newspapers. Like, you can put them all in one envelope. It's a lot of paper. Um, but so I don't know how long it'll last. There are. There are still, I don't know, Kevin, 17,000 newspapers around the country, something like that. There's still a lot of newspapers um, in small communities. In fact, people are still afraid to invest in newspapers, a lot of people. You might notice Warren Buffett's not afraid to invest in newspapers. Um, if I were a betting man with what I know about the world and all I had was a, a, a small fortune and I wanted to go turn it into a, a bigger fortune or at least have a good living, I would think about buying some community newspapers in small towns out in the Midwest. They, they, they cash flow. Um, uh, nobody else is going to be buying them, and they're great ways to make a living and great ways to have a lot of fun. Um, a, a newspaper is one of the most complicated. The, the news operation alone um, gets you a lot of attention, wanted and un unwanted. The sales operation, sales is a complicated business. Um, manufacturing, distribution. We, Brian could probably give more facts than this, but I remember um, one day, I can't remember if it was the peak of our circulation or recently or whatever, but I think we drove 30,000 miles a day delivering the AJC all over Georgia. Just think about how many miles that is. It's, it's extraordinary. It's a complex logistical operation, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so I hope it's around for a long time. I don't know how long the print part will be around. Probably not forever. We'll all be plugged into goggles sooner or later. And, um, <laughs> but we have a lot of fun with our papers and try to nurture them, make them, keep them great. Alex. Yes, sir. Um, thanks for coming today and sharing your time. And I really appreciate the optimism you have on your vision. I'm curious as a leader, what are the things that you are most concerned about or that kind of the, the biggest challenges that you think either you as a leader have to face or, or just business deals with today? The, um, the biggest concern, I mean, the biggest concern I have is uh, making, is, is, you know, the war for talent. Um, the, the thing that makes us successful, if you think back about what got us into this, what got us into that, what made this successful, I can, I can in my head, think of specific names and specific people who were extraordinary. Um, they, it, they were either born with extraordinary capabilities or they had been in the company so long, it was, it's like the outliers. After 10,000 hours, you're ready to rock and roll. You are capable of doing extraordinary things. And some combination of those two things, I can think of multiple individuals that have put us in the right place at the right time. And I always think to myself, which one of those individuals is in the making right now? They're, they're 10 years through a 20-year career, and they're about to leave. And we don't know it. And we don't know what they would have been in 20 years at this company. Uh, but making sure that they don't, uh, that they don't leave, that we keep the greatest people and that we attract the greatest people. Um, I think about that. I think about our people. The other thing I think about, frankly, is just Google. <laughs> Everything they do bugs us um, from <laughs> Google, the news. I mean, they steal our news and, and distribute it. Um, uh, driverless cars and um, everything digital. Google Fiber, you know, they'll come and say, we're just going to distribute, you know, Internet that's faster for free. And you're, you're like, how does that work? You know, there's <laughs> absolutely no financial return to that. Um, but they, they disrupt everything we do. Um, and they do it intentionally, and it usually is in the name of moving the world along a little faster. And uh, it's, it's an, a pretty extraordinary uh, strategy they have. Um, but it, it keeps you on your toes. So, And I guess also the last thing would be just the, 
how fast things ch things change. Um, it used to be, you know, newspapers you know, in the 30s, and then you know, TV comes along in the 40s and 50s, and kind of turns into a big thing in the 60s, and by the 70s, it's starting to affect readership. It happens over, you know, long periods of time. You know, now things can change just like that. You can be gone tomorrow, um, and you, you just that'll keep you up at night. Um, particularly if you're sort of thinking about the whole enchilada, you don't you don't want to drop it. So um, we talk about listening posts, and we talk about you know placing bets on various things, and sort of hedging your bets, and having a lot going on out there, so your eggs aren't all in one basket. Um, but the rapidity of change is is a big one. Anything all else? right. Thank you. Thank you. Be back right there. Well, he didn't go to Georgia, but I think he's a pretty bright guy. So <laughs> that's uh, not a lot going on up there. Good guy. Alex, thanks for telling the story. It's, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that we sit and we occupy this world, and we all live in Atlanta, and we have a company this transformative. We have a company this diverse with this many great people, many of whom we probably know or educated with or spend time in our various social lives. And what a remarkable job they do with their values and leadership to intentionally stay out of the public eye when all of us and many organizations are doing everything in the world they can to jump right in the middle of it. So, Alex, thanks so much for your time. It's, uh, if you'll come back up real quick, it's our tradition to present a keepsake to all of our Terry Third Thursday speakers. I'd like to give you this glass sculpture. This is created by Loretta Eby as a token of our appreciation. Thanks so much Thank you. for being with us this morning. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Everyone, as a reminder, uh, parking validation, uh, it, you should have already handled it, but if you do not, uh, they can take care of you on the way out. See you in a month. Thanks for being with us.